As inheritors of the grand matrix, we are indoctrinated into a projection of reality, which is itself established upon a preponderance of lies. Speculative assumptions carefully crafted as web of deceit. Awakening makes one question everything thought relevant. All that one had so innocently accepted in assurance as evidentiary truth. Similar to the day after coming to truth on the conspiracy of 9-11 and government-sponsored terror, all must be reassessed upon the certainty that things are not as they appear to be. The seeker of lost paradise may seem a fool to those who have never sought the other worlds. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Secrets Revealed, and I'm honored and blessed to have as guest again this evening my good friend, Jonathan Kleck. Johnny, are you there, brother? I'm here. What's up, Zen? Thanks for having me. Oh, man, always a good time and always a pleasure, and I'm um, glad to fellowship with you in this regard, and uh, looking forward to the show. There's a lot to talk about, and the revelations are seemingly nonstop, and um, it just the truth that you and I have been confirming witness for um, in, you know, as far as your spiritual gift and the the study, uh, the discernment I've been brought to in studying all of the canonical as well as the extra biblical text, um, that these little known truths are being revealed through our our parallel walks. And so it's a it's a blessing, um, brother, to call you as a, a brother in Christ and to uh, walk in similarity in, in being a servant unto the Most High in the way that you yourself are. Both of us have dedicated our entire lives to doing this work and prioritize it as the focus of our purpose and our reason for being here. And Absolutely. I know, yeah, both of us hold it as the most important thing um, of, you know, our everyday affairs. And so I think that's one of the reasons why that uh, the Most High has allowed us to be vessel for such truths. You know, we're like all, all the listeners here, you know, they're, we're wisdom keepers and uh, holders of the secret. And it's a such a huge blessing and honor and privilege. And at the same time, uh, sometimes a, a burden to to carry this weight. Um, Boy, go ahead, brother. Yeah, well, Zen, I feel the same way, brother. It's good to have a confirming witness. I mean, you know, no doubt. What, what will we do without each other? Right, <laughs> you know? no doubt. Yeah. Freak out. Yeah. yeah. You know what you were saying, you know, about this constant revelation. Well, you know what I noticed? It's, And this was just fascinating. And I'm looking up at, you know, we have you now going. And I, I want to encourage the people that maybe – our listeners to go to the YouNow platform also, because we have a video venue going at the same time, but you're going to have to keep your audio going from your, from your radio venue with Zen. But, you know, we have imagery. You can go and you can look at all this imagery that we're going to be talking about. And we have these show note links and Dave is, call him Dave the Wave. Dave is, is he'll drop a, a link into your chat room. And I encourage everybody to grab that link and just look at the, you know, copious amount of information and truth. It's mind blowing. And the reason, you know, I wanted to comment on the, the amount of revelation is, is for this reason. When you know the truth, once the truth abides in you, what happens is you go and you re evaluate everything right. i mean everything because when you woke up on when i woke up on a planet that i no longer belong to i realized wow i went through 40 years of my life in a deep sleep it's crazy it's almost hard to imagine and then once you know the truth well then all things become new and just like the bible says you know um 
you know, behold, I make all things new. And so when you become new, well, then the world becomes new, too. And you have to kind of re-educate yourself on what everything really is. And it is so far from what you were shown or what you believed. It, it's just a constant um, path of continual discovery and revelation. Yeah. And that's what's so exciting about it. I think uh, I read a comment the other day, you know, in one of the videos, I think, on YouTube. Um, someone said, you know, it's like a constant treasure chest coming to get this information because, you know, when you're a little kid, you know, you'll find like, uh, I remember when I was little, there was like, uh, you know, you'd have a cousin or, and then have a toy chest that you didn't get in very often. And you'd lift the lid on that thing and everything was new. You know, he's like, Oh, what is right. it? Oh, I'll well, check that out. And so every time you go into that treasure chest, you're pulling out something that's new to you and it's exciting. And, and that's really what we're doing. And, but it's all the revelation of Christ. And, and, you know, I, I, I came to this the other day and I shared it with everybody on, on the radio program that I, that I do. And I said, you know, I, I finally have the meaning of life. I get it. I finally, after, even after being saved since 2002, when I got saved in the alley and after all these years of disclosure and all this, you know, digging, digging and, and finally you know, the final disclosure of this, you know, giant altar in the Vatican being a big dead sheep, which confirms the night I got saved. It, it, it finally came to me. I was like, oh my gosh, I understand the meaning of life. And, you know, most people never even, you know, ponder what is the meaning of life. You know, they just, they try and get through it. They try and get a house, try and get the car, try and get things paid for, whatever. Pay for the kids, get the kids off to college, you know, do this, do that, take a few vacations, and boom, life's over. And well, what was that all about? Right. You know what I mean? And so I was sitting here in my little, you know, cubicle where I have all my screens, and I was praying, and and I realized after looking at the revelation that the Lord's given me and all this information, you know, and it goes hand in hand with all your stuff. I thought, wow, I, I I get it, the meaning of life. And and I can sum it up this easily. The meaning of life, once you know the truth, is to serve the Lord your God and Him only. Yes. And I was like, wow, I get it. I finally get it because we're on a prison planet where we're born into a duality where we're divided. We are this kingdom that's divided within our yes. own heart. Yes. We all have this divided heart when we're born and we're all trying to find out what we're supposed to do or going to do profession wise or, you know, am I, you know, find the right girl, find the right guy, who you know, whatever, you know, whoever you are, you're always trying to find what's going to make your life what you think it's supposed to be, whether or not it's education, whether or not it's some sports, you know, or some kind of training and you know, whatever, you know, your athletic thing might be or whatever it is. Everyone's got their own thing. And you can look and look and look and you can do whatever. I did so many things. And you know what? Even after attaining things that most people would never even dream of attaining in life, which I, I was able to attain, at the end of it, I was like, my gosh, it's vacuous. It's like a vacuum. There's not, it's, it was pointless. I was like, oh my gosh, I did all this stuff. That most most people would, you know, people would always tell me, Johnny, God, I want your life, dude. You have the best. You have the coolest life in the world. And for a while, I thought, yeah, 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 I do, I do. <laughs> and then I was like, you know, yeah, I got everything I want, and it sucks. <laughs> and I was like, what, what's wrong? I, you know, it's something's wrong. And so anyway, you know, back 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 again to the whole revelation. When the spirit of truth abides in you and lives in you, then all things have become new. And I do mean all things. And the word of God is, I mean, geez, I mean, that's 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 my, you know, that's my thrill is when the Lord just, you know, opens up the word of God. Yes. And and one thing I want to try and give away to the audience tonight is the key to the kingdom of heaven. I do it all the time. I, I can give it to you. I can show it to you. I can. But I can't open the door for you. I can give you the key. I can show you the door, but you got to do it yourself. And um, you can go look yourself and you can, once you know what what it is and 
you can go put it to the test yourself. But in order to get through the door, uh, you have to, um, the word in Greek is agonizomai. Um, it says, it says, narrow is the gate and hard is the way that leads to life. Well, the word and few there be that enter in. Well, the word to enter is to is agonizomai. And it means it means to agonize. It's like being birthed, just like, you know, when you see a birth going on. Well, you know, when I saw my kids coming into the world being birthed, I was there. And uh, it doesn't look like a lot of fun. It's, you know, it's agonizing uh, for the woman birthing the child into the world. And it's kind of the same way to birth yourself into the kingdom. You have to strain to to want to know the truth and you have to be willing, you know, to want to know the truth at all costs. And I was. And you know what? Then when I was birthed into the kingdom, all things became new. And now the Bible is wide open. And uh, and I would I would just honestly tell everybody, guys, I was called to 100 percent no line the night I got saved. I was told by the Lord himself, you may not lie even one percent like when you talk, when you speak. Uh, exaggeration is a form of lying. Don't do it. It's OK to be excited. But, you know, just tell the straight up truth. Be forthright. Everything you say. And and I'll, I'll tell you, this is the unrolled scroll. And what that means is. Um, back in the old days when they used to unroll the scriptures, they would go up and down at the same time and unroll the scroll and, uh, and read from the scriptures. And, and oddly enough, you know, the, um, the scriptures, the way they unfolded are just like that because it's a reflection of Christ on the cross is upright. And then if you had a mirror reflection, it would be upside down, you know, like let's say his cross was crucified, right? Or he was crucified right in front of a, a body of water, well, you would see the reflection of that cross in the water and and it would be right side up and upside down. And that's why Peter was given the keys to the kingdom of heaven because Peter was crucified upside down. So tonight, what I'd really like to do is I'd like to use a, you know just a few scriptures, give everybody a few scriptures just to get under your belt and then um, make sure you all have those. And then I'd like to move into some of this disclosure, um, you know, what's happening now because the the light is shining on the word of God and stuff that's been locked up um, has been um, revealed now. And the Bible is wide open. The scroll is wide open. I think I'm going to I'd like to refer everybody real quick to. Um, let's see, is it Daniel nine still up the scroll until the time of the end? I believe it's either Daniel 9 or Daniel 12. Um, but I'm just going off the cuff, guys. So let's let's just have a a look. Yeah, and and here it is. And I want to read to y'all from from uh, I want to read from Daniel 12 because in my personal testimony that is on YouTube and that's going in this DVD tonight that we're working on. Um, you know, I met Michael, the archangel, in an alley. I mean, I know that's hard to believe. And I, I understand if you're like, yeah, whatever. Because I would too. I'd be being totally honest. I would probably go, yeah, okay, whatever. But now when you look at my testimony and you look at the uh, 14 years of evidence that the Lord's given to me, and now uh, out of 7 billion people on the entire planet, uh, the Lord gave me the ability to show everybody what the largest altar in the world in St. Peter's Basilica is an image of a, a giant dead sheep <laughs> with its tongue sticking out. I mean, out of 7 billion people on planet Earth, the Lord gave me the ability to show you that the largest altar in the world that has the most number of members in the world hidden in plain sight the altar is a giant dead sheep, as well as when you turn it upside down, it is the female reproductive system. And it literally turns into a giant vagina. And it shows all of God's angels, God's children going into uh, this vagina as if it is a vortex. And they're being pulled into it like there's no escape. And what's fascinating is, that is identical to 14 years ago in an alley when I got saved. 
I was told to say a prayer after I let, let me be very clear about this. Uh, I was Michael, uh, the angel. He stepped up to me. He said, pray with me, my brother. And when he said that, he came alongside of me facing the same exact direction as I was. Uh, at first, he was looking me straight in the eye and he held his hands out to the side. He said, pray with me, my brother. And then I looked at him and he walked alongside of me. So we were shoulder to shoulder facing the same direction. And we both had our palms up. And then he led me in a prayer, you know, which was our father who art in heaven. And we prayed that prayer and then water and light came down on me. And I was filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, I was literally, I'd turned to light. I'd gone from darkness straight to light. And then after that, I was I was stupefied. I was in complete stupefaction. And he looked at me and he said, you say how Mary. And I looked at him knowing something that I just knew it was not right. And then as I be began to utter the words, I felt death. Okay, that's that's part of the court record. The Lord told me I had to put my testimony up um, years ago. I think in 2011, the Lord told me, okay, now you have to put your personal testimony on YouTube. And I didn't want to do it. <laughs> I was like, oh, God, no, please. <laughs> and he told me, you have to do it. And I, I thought, oh. And so, you know, I, I did what he said, and now it has been completely, uh, you know, upheld by the Lord himself. Because he showed me that the largest altar in the world is a dead sheep. The, the whole thing, and it's also the female reproductive system. Well, 14 years before, when I stood in the alley and I prayed with Michael to our father, when he called me my, his brother, uh, I said, and our father, then he said, you say, Hail Mary. And when I said the words to that prayer, I felt death. I felt death. And then shortly after that, you know, the ability he gave me, I could look at an image of the Virgin, which is what the Catholics worship. And if you take an image of the Virgin and you turn it upside down, the entire image becomes a dead sheep. So we have a dead sheep uh, 14 years ago. You know, when I prayed to the Virgin, I felt death and I, I testified to that. And then I can sh I can take an image of a Virgin and turn it upside down. And I can show you the whole image is a dead sheep. And here it is 14 years later. And the Lord, uh, you know, by a bizarre set of circumstances, has me look at the largest altar in the world with the largest number of members claiming to be Christian in the entire world. And I can show you that the whole thing is a dead sheep and it's a vagina. <laughs> I mean, that's just one of the craziest things I've ever heard. Yeah. Even from where I'm sitting, it's right. just, yeah, it's mind boggling. So I want to read Daniel 12 because... I want to I want to read this to you. Most people do not have any idea what a couple of these words mean, and I I want to I want to absolutely blow your mind because the time of testing is here. Um, the great tribulation is at the door. We are literally I mean we are moments away from it, moments away, and I know that because I'm a harbinger. I got saved, and uh, the information I I was given. It all bears witness to exactly what I'm saying. The information itself will will uphold itself. The truth always upholds itself. So here we go. I want to read to you from Daniel 12. And um, here we go. It says, and at that time, which is the time of the end, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble as was never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. I want to stop right there for a second. It says, Michael will stand up for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble. Most people have never, ever looked up the word trouble. It's going to blow your mind. The word trouble is a Hebrew word, 68, 69, and it's pronounced sarah. Sarah, and the word trouble means a female rival. Huh. That's what it means. Sarah. So it says, and at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince with standard for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of female rival, affliction, tribulation. Well, isn't that funny? When I stood in an alley with Michael, he, after I got saved, he told me to pray a Hail Mary, and I felt death. And here I am in Daniel 12, reading it. It says at that time, what time? The time of the end. 
Michael shall stand up that standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble. And the word trouble means female rival, adversary, affliction, tribulation. That's impossible. And so now I can give a testimony that, yes, um, I, I was in an alley with Michael. He told me to say the Hail Mary after I was saved in order to show me who our enemy was and who is our enemy, the female rival. And that's what I've been showing everybody since I got saved. That's why you turn the virgin upside down. It's a dead sheep. So now watch this. As we continue, the whole point of this is I want everybody to understand that the Bible is the scroll, you know, referred to. And um, it's referred to in Isaiah 29. Um, after, you know, uh, you can see it says in it, uh, the deaf shall hear the words of the scroll and out of the obscurity and the darkness, the blind will see. And that's by turning everything upside down. So if you go look at Isaiah 29, 15 and 16, it will say, surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. And then in verse probably 18 or 19, and it says, and in that day, the deaf shall hear the words of the scroll and out of the darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. Okay, so watch this. I'm going to prove to you that we're at the end. Okay, so Michael shall stand up and there shall be a time of trouble as there never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. The word book, uh, I want you, is called Saphir. And if you go look at Isaiah 29, when it says in that day, the deaf will hear the words of the book. So it's the same exact word. It's Hebrew word 5612, Sephir or Sifra. And that means, it means evidence scroll. Um, by implication, a book, bill, evidence, and scroll. So everyone's name that is found written in the scroll shall be delivered at the time of the end. And here it comes. This, this includes anyone that's waking up now. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as, as the brightness of the firmament, and they shall turn many to righteousness as the star, and shall turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the scroll, even unto the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood over other to the one on one side of the bank of the river and the other on the other side of the bank. I just want to take a moment to bring something up. There is that two and one thing, you know, one on one side. One on the other it reminds me of the Twin Towers right. on different sides of the river, like your north and south of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever that it shall be for time, times and half a times when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And I heard, but I understood not. Then, then said I, O Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Well, I'm here to tell you that is unsealed now. And I know that's, I know everyone's like, wow, yeah, well, I would encourage you to challenge me. I, I don't want you to believe me. I want you to go look at the show notes that we've provided. I want you to go look at, you know, Zen's work, uh, the extra biblical text. I encourage you to go look at a series I have on YouTube called You Are the Fallen, parts one through eight. And once you start turning everything upside down, you're going to go, wait a minute, something is very, very wrong here. And once you ask yourself, how are these things possible? 
Then what happens to most people that I've seen that want to know the truth? They cry out to God. And they're like, oh, God, help me. And that's when God comes in. And that's that's where you that's where you begin to agonizomai, agonizomai. You begin to struggle, just like uh, the birthing process, and then you get birthed into the kingdom because you want to know the truth and you struggle through it. You struggle through it, and then God will open the doors. You know, as you move towards Him, He moves towards you, and then the door will be open. Jesus said, "Anyone who knocks, the door is open to you." And so, but you got to knock. You have to, and because if you don't knock, there won't be a door open to you, and you have to go and do it. Yeah, it has to be with your heart. You have to really say, you know what, I want to know. All right, hold on. Hold on, everyone. We'll be right back. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Before him all the nations will be gathered, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And then the king will tell those on his right hand, Come, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was prison, in prison and you came to me. Matthew 25, 31 through 36. And so this whole theme, as far as the separation of the goat and the sheep, the parable of the wheat and the tares, the people of righteousness from the people of wickedness, the whole duality and the temptation of the two angels that are indwelling within us and our choice every moment of every day to feed one or the other, to follow one or the other, to walk down the broad path of destruction or to tread carefully the narrow way. That is what all of this is really about. And Jonathan and I are trying to give you the keys to make sense of scripture in a way that unlocks all these things in revelation so that you can have the eyes to see the ears to hear and a mind to understand. And so that when you read, you don't just gloss over the words, but that you are being fed with very deeply profound truths, the kind of things which the most high wants all of us to really understand in profound manner so that we can understand and really know what our true purpose, our reason for really being here and what all of this is about uh, really comes forth and really, you know, really take takes a hold um, within the deeper interiors of your soul and so that you can then proceed forward in such knowing. Jonathan? Yeah, it's true. You know, and what I'm what I'm going to share with you now, you know, is it's the same. It's the same idea. It's the same concept as the Bible. It's the same thing. But the truth is, you cannot you cannot get to the point to where you overcome your duality unless you do it through Christ. And yes. see, the thing is, there's no other way through the, to the Father except through the Son. But but this concept, this concept of our duality is pervasive through through all cultures. I want to read to you and I and I, I sent an image today the way of a wolf and the wolf has half its face black and half its face white. And I want to read to you an, an American Cherokee parable. And this is a parable from the Cherokee Indians. I'm part Cherokee. My mom was Cherokee, her dad was her her dad was uh, almost all Cherokee. And this is a, a teaching from, you know, the Cherokee tribe. But, you know, it, it has its truism. But remember, there's no way to overcome um, the sin issue without Christ. So I don't want you to think it's OK to try and be one thing and then the other goes away because that's not correct. 
the only way you can overcome any of it is through Christ. And I, I, I mean, I'm here to tell you that's one thing I can say with 100 percent surety because I've lived it. So here we go. Uh, an old Cherokee chief teaching his grandson about life. A fight is going on inside me, he said to the, to the boy. It is a terrible fight, and it is between two wolves. One is evil. He is anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, self-doubt, and ego. The other is good. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The same fight is going inside of you and inside of every person too. The grandson then asked his grandfather, grandfather, which wolf will win? And the old chief simply replied, replied the one that you feed. Exactly. And so it's the same concept. It is absolutely the same idea. And in the scripture that Zen was reading, you know, when the Son of Man comes in all his glory, it's Matthew 25, with all his holy angels, you know, he's going to separate the sheep from the goats, and he's going to say, Blessed are you, my Father, enter into the eternal kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was naked. And you clothed me, I, you know, I was in prison and you visited me. And then the righteous will say to him, when did we ever do any of these things for you? When did we ever give you food? When did we ever give you a drink? When did we ever clothe you or visit you in prison? And the king will say to them, when you did it for the least yeah. of these children of mine, you did it to me. And so... He's telling you, when you do anything for anybody and you minister to anyone, whether or not it's a drink of water, or, uh, some food or, you know, some guy that's standing on the corner and a lot of people won't get hand out even a dollar because they're judging what he's going to go do with the dollar they gave him like it makes a difference. Right. It's a, you know what I mean? And so it's a it's it's a condition of your heart that Jesus is talking about. Because he says, when you do it for the least of these of mine, you're doing it for me. Because we are all one thing, even though we have this duality that has happened to us, you know, through this breeding thing of Satan. But when you minister to anyone, you're ministering to God himself. Yes. And then, then, you know, subsequently he says to the unrighteous, he says, into the eternal flames. And this is very interesting. I, I looked at this a long time ago and I went, wow. And the eternal flames are prepared for the devil and his demons. Well, he tells the goats, hey, you guys, into the eternal flames prepared for the devil and his demons. So the only the only thing that goes into the flames are demons. That's what it says. Well, that, that would be because if, if you're part of this fall and you're part of the judgment, then you have to, in one way, shape, or form, belong to Satan. And if you are worthy of the resurrection, then you were predestined in Christ to not have to go there. And so it's fascinating because he says to those, he says, into the eternal flames prepared for the devil and his demons, for I was hungry and you gave me nothing. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. He gave him the same list of criteria. And then they say to him, well, when did we ever not feed you? Or when did we ever not give you something to drink? And he will, the king will reply to them, when you didn't do this for the least of these of mine, you didn't do it for me. And so that shows you that God owns all of it. Every bit of it belongs to him. So if you, you don't have love in your heart, you don't have kindness. You don't have any benevolence, just like the good wolf, you know, and you have the other thing going and you, you know, you're too cool to hand somebody a dollar or two that's standing on the corner, regardless of what they're going to use it for. It doesn't matter. You know what right. I mean? It, it's a condition of your heart. Yes. So, yeah, I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. 
But now I just I want to get into this this duality and this angel uh, thing and this you know the the truth and and uh, the best way I can give it to you and uh, anyone that's a new listener I know everybody that's here listening from the program I do they've heard this repetitively and they and 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 I will continue to do it because it's what opened the door for me and when you open a door by the way if the door is locked which uh, Satan did. He locked the door, um, which is our flesh. If the door is locked, then to have a key is a good way to open that door, and I'm going to give you that key. And so I hope everybody that's listening, that's a new listener, that's comes here to, to Zen's program, I hope you uh, take a moment to listen and um, write these down, okay? So I'm going to quote this off the top of my head. It's Isaiah 29, 15, and 16. And I want, I would like for you to look at the Good News translation as well as the King James translation. Um, I'm a King James guy uh, because it, it fits in with more other scriptures that are parallel scriptures. However, for the understanding of it, the Good News translation is really awesome. So here it goes. It's, 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 it starts on Isaiah 29, 15. And it says, those who try to hide their plans from the Lord are doomed. They carry out their schemes in secret and they think no one will see them or know what they are doing. They turn everything upside down. Okay, so apparently there's, you know, someone that's hiding everything and and what they're hiding, you know, they turn upside down. It's not uh, some just analogous, you know, euphemistic uh, saying. He's literally saying turn it upside down. And if, if you'll take the time to go look at the videos I told you about on my YouTube site, which is The Jonathan Kleck. Someone can write that in Zen's chat room for me, please. Um, if you'll go to take the time to look at these videos I did called You Are the Fallen, you will see this altar in the, the Vatican, and the whole thing is a big dead sheep with its tongue sticking out. And so if we apply Isaiah 29, 15 to that, and it says those who try and hide their plans from the Lord – are doomed. They carry out their schemes in secret. Well, wonder what their schemes are. And then it says they turn everything upside down. Well, if you're looking at an altar of a big dead sheep that's hidden right in front of your face, and you're like, oh my gosh, it's a dead sheep. And then you turn the sheep upside down, and it's a big vagina. I mean, and it shows God's angels being, you know, um, literally pulled into that as a vortex, well, then you got to ask yourself, well, wait a minute, what are their plans? You know, those who hide their plans from the Lord, they turn everything upside down. So if we look at that and we go, well, let's turn it upside down, the dead sheep, and it's a vagina and God's angels are being sucked into it. What their plans are to have God's children birthed into the flesh, and that becomes your prison suit because you were once uh, an angel and now you're stuck in the flesh. Welcome to the world. Right. And yeah. Anyway, did you want to jump in, Zen? Yeah, I did. Um, actually, I wanted to read a comment um, that a person left on my Facebook about this exact thing. And then the reply, just to bring out a little bit more and to confirm what you had said. Um, she's, it, the lady's name is Lachelle. She says, uh, greetings, Zen. I pray that all is well with you and your family. I have a two-part question for you. One, the show that you did with Jonathan Cluck, why did he say that the angels are going into the vortex to be born? Why are they going into the vortex? Number two, what is a recommended Bible that I can study with all the books, including the lost books and the original language in the Bible? Um, and then the answers that I gave her is... Hello, sister. He is connecting the vortex with birth because that is what happens and where angels go in being born. This happened to us all. Humans are not separate from angels other than we are now dressed in flesh. We are both imbued with the same immortal imprint, which is our own connecting link to the creator. Number two, they are going into the vortex to be born. Uh, enter flesh and occupy physical form. Hope this helps. God bless. And with regard to um, 
the the texts, uh, the different Bible, biblical texts, I said, I say read everything. Let them hide nothing from you, but also recognize that some texts can harm you. It can be unwise and even dangerous to read something steeped in deep occult. Anything else, study it while you can. Open access to knowledge is rare in this world and a privilege one that one that one should acknowledge wisdom comes from studying all things but also in knowing what to leave alone but for the most part study everything and then decide for yourself all right back to you brother absolutely because you know condemnation before investigation is the highest form of ignorance i had a friend of mine that was mormon and he kept telling me, no, Jonathan, man, you know, you say that, you know, and, and you don't even do it yourself. And I said, Gary, you know, I don't know if you know, but, you know, um, the guy that you consider, you know, the head of your religion, he was ousted by his own people. <laughs> and I went and did all my homework on Mormonism. And I was like, have you ever read the history of Joseph Smith and all that? And he had never done it. And I was like, uh -huh. okay, well, so, you know, and it also gives you... And in, uh, an ability to talk intelligently with those people that want to come against you. Right. And you can say, well, you know what? I've actually gone and studied what you're talking about, what you're part of. And did you know? And then you can speak intelligently and you can probably show them things that they never knew. Okay. But I want to I want to get to this um, this um, Isaiah 29 thing. If anyone goes and looks at the Vatican itself, uh, I challenge you. I challenge everybody listening to the show. Everybody. I challenge you to open Google Earth, and I challenge you to type in St. Peter's Basilica, and, you know, in Rome. Uh, and so I challenge you to do that. And when you when you type in St. Peter's Basilica, um, and you come in from above, you know, from the satellite view, you're going to see a giant black keyhole. And then if you orientate your keyhole to where the circular part is at the top of the page and then the skirt is underneath is at the bottom. Well, the Vatican, the building itself, well, is an upside down cross. Well, most people know that an upside down cross represents the occult. Well, let me read to you what the Bible says about the teachers of religion. Woe unto you teachers of religion, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering, you hindered. You know, because a lot of people, when they come to that moment in their life where they're like, oh, man, I've done so much wrong. I need to, you know, you know, a lot of people come to the realization that they've done a lot of bad stuff. And then usually what they do is they go to a building called a church or one of their, you know, friends that's into the religious thing say, well, why don't you go to church with us? Go to church with us. And so what happens is they walk into a building and then they're surrounded by churchianity. And I'm telling you, honestly, uh, every single church I've been to and I'm uh, well, except one which met in a high school gymnasium. Um, every one that I went to that was organized and had pastors and, you know, different programs, every single one of them wanted nothing to do with the truth. I'm not kidding. That was that was the first part of my ministry the Lord sent me just to show me. Now, I had to understand. I was like, something really weird is going on. They won't even let me show anyone an image of the, the $20 bill, the Twin Tower bombing on the $20 bill. They literally pushed me into a room and said, you're not allowed to show people that. Uh, I said, well, what, I can't fold a $20 bill and show people a, the image of the Twin Tower bombing on the $20 bill? And they said, no, you can't do that here. I was like, wow. Right. So I'm not allowed to show someone that if I fold a $20 bill in the shape of a pentagram and turn it upside down, that it turns into the Twin Towers. I'm not allowed to do that. And they said, no, you can't come here. And that's when I knew, wow. You know, and I had several other things, but besides that. So here it is. So it says, woe unto you teachers of religion. You have taken away the key of knowledge. Well, I just gave you the key. All you have to do is turn everything upside down. Uh, when you turn everything upside down, you'll go, wait a minute. 
Uh, why is it when I turn an image of the Virgin upside down, it's a dead sheep? See, because now you're recognizing one way it's one thing, but when you turn it upside down, it's something else. And I challenge everybody to, no, I don't I don't want you to believe me. I want you to go type in Google Images. I want you to type in St. Peter's Throne, um, you know, uh, Basilica, and you'll see the, the throne itself. It's a big dead sheep. And I challenge you to turn it upside down, go open up another window of Google Images and get the female reproductive system and copy paste it to the same page that that altar's on and slide it right over. Shazam. So why is the largest church in the world that's got the most number of members? Why do they have a giant dead sheep hidden in plain sight? And then the next question is, why is it a vagina? You know, I mean, you got to ask yourself that question, don't you? I mean, intelligently, you'd have to go, wow, that's some crazy stuff. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, you know, everybody's on their knees in front of a big upside down vagina. If that doesn't disturb you, then, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe you might just want to go live out in the woods for a while and, and just and not consider anything. But the reality is, it is. It's a giant vagina. And then all then you gotta ask yourself, why are all the angels being pulled into it like it's a vortex, like it's a black hole? And they're you can you can look at the looks of the faces of the angels and they, it's not good. <laughs> they're not going, yay, this looks like fun. They're like, <laughs> no, this is bad. And so why are all these angels terrified and they're being pulled into a giant female reproductive system. That's just crazy. And now, so now I've kind of set up the second half of the show because now we have uh, Zen. Now I've got all the Versace stuff ready to go. Excellent. Uh, and we have uh, we have that whole folder, and Excellent. so we can but we can both go over that and Great. freak uh, out. <laughs> hey, before we do so, before we get to the next break, why don't you give out uh, your website contact information where people can go to catch your radio programs sure you know if you want to catch the radio program maybe someone out there that's listening from our our group Alyssa or dave the wave or any of you guys or don anyone anyone that's in zen's chat room please give them the link to blog talk and then also please give them the link to uh, uh we have another we have a website that's uh before the fire it's the word B, B E, and the number four, the fire, before the fire.com. And if you go there, we have so much extensive video. Uh, you can watch, you know, hours of video uh, with this stuff explained. And then we have links to, you know, videos that I have on YouTube that just show this stuff un unraveling. There's also, a, there's also a website called jonathancleck.com. I, I really don't visit it very often. Uh, to be honest, but it's an older website, but it's full of good information. It's got it's got all the same stuff, but it's not as up to date. And then also, we're doing a DVD right now, and I I highly suggest I highly suggest if you want the mystery of life, the mystery of humanity, and you want it on DVD, and you want to literally sit and freak out, you need to go to beforethefire.com. You need to go to a page that says support, and it shows you how to send a self-addressed stamped envelope. Listen very carefully. There is no charge. The DVDs are free, but you have to send your own self-addressed stamped envelope within an envelope and make sure that a DVD will fit in the envelope that you put inside of your envelope that you send to us, okay? Because it makes it very difficult. I send out lots of DVDs. And so I need everybody to help me out and do, do their own part. Make sure you put at least six forever stamps on your self-addressed stamped envelope. And that makes it, you know, easy when I get to the post office because we end up paying a ton of postage because people don't get the postage right. So, uh, yeah, please, if you'll do that, we'll send you a free DVD. And then if you want to support it, I, I mean, if you watch it and it changes your life, Go back and support it. Then we can send more out to other people. That's the way it works. Excellent, brother. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about, uh, really quick, uh, about what you and Clay are working on um, in the, the, the video? 
information? Yeah, you know, we're we're doing a beginning to end video. I mean, like I told you at the beginning of this program, I said, you know, I know that's that's pretty pretty hard to wrap your brain around. Right. And I, I told you, man, I would I would question anybody that told me they met Michael. I would. I would say, okay, well, uh, if you say so, there's got to be some kind of evidence. And, you know, the evidence, you know, without, you know, in, in believe me, sometimes it's hard to talk about some of this stuff because I don't want to come across as, you know, arrogant or, you know, or pontificating anything about myself. But, you know, when God calls a servant, he qualifies them. He doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies those that he calls. And so what he did for me is, you know, I was I was just a, you know, a wild man, guys. I was a skydiving instructor, just wild man, sunglass company, just partier. And, and the Lord called me and then he equipped me to do the ministry I'm doing. And that means laying of hands on people that are blind in one eye and people that have had incurable eye problems, people that had cancer. Um, you know, the Lord's had me lay hands on them and they recovered. I mean, and the, and the, see, the Bible says these signs will accompany those that believe on my name. They'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. They'll speak in tongues. That's another gift the Lord gave me. I speak in tongues. And, uh, you know, it's just, but those things have, those things go with the office. You know, he's like, okay, you work for me. You know, I got to give you some of these things so people actually know you do. And then the testimony itself will bear witness of the truth because of that altar. All right, we'll be back in just a few minutes, everyone. Uh, also, just so you know, I speak in poems. <laughs> All right, be right back. A really quick story called The Creation of Souls. Unlike the human body, which was created on the sixth day, the soul was created on the first day before anything else in the world. In that first hour, God created all souls and placed them in the highest heaven where they remain until called to enter the body chosen for them. When a baby is conceived, Layla, the angel of night, brings the fertilized egg before God who decides its fate, whether it will be a boy or a girl, rich or poor, strong or weak, Beautiful or ugly, fat or thin, wise or foolish. Only one decision does God leave in the hands of the unborn soul, whether it will be righteous or wicked. Then God sends the angel of souls to the highest heaven to bring back the soul destined for that particular body. Always the soul rebels, for compared to the celestial world, the lower world is a poor place full of sorrow and pain. But God reprimands the rebellious soul, saying, Hush, for this is why I created you, and so the soul enters the unborn child and nestles quietly under the mother's breast. The next morning, a second angel carries the soul to paradise where it sees all the righteous enjoying eternal happiness. If you follow God's Torah and live a worthy life, explains the angel, you will one day join these happy creatures here. But if not, and that night the angel takes the soul to the gates of Gehenna, where it sees the angels of destruction whipping the wicked souls with burning lashes. Such is the fate of those who are devoted their lives to sin and cruelty, the angel says. It is for you to choose for yourself between the morning and the night of that day. The angel reveals to the unborn soul its future life where it will live and where it will die and where it will be buried. And then at the end of the nine months, the angel announces that it is time for the soul to leave the warm refuge of the womb. Oh no, cries the soul, for that will be too much to bear. But the angel quickly silences it. So God has decreed, against your will you were formed and against your will you will be born and against your will you will one day die such as fate. And with that, the angel strikes the newborn baby under the nose, leaving a small cleft there, and then he extinguishes the light shining above its head, and instantly the soul forgets everything 
it has learned during the previous nine months. And then the baby emerges into the world crying and afraid. Each soul spends the rest of its time on earth recovering all that it once knew. Yikes. <laughs> oh, my uh Boy, that rings true, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sounds uh, reminiscent of 40 years of my life. Right. Yes, it does. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I'll tell you what, you know, honestly, I tell people this sometimes and I say, you know, as tough as, as it's been since I got saved, and believe me when I tell you, uh, the night I walked out of that alley, uh, the very first thing I walked into, literally I w when I exited the alley, was a carving in a wall. I mean, a very large carving uh, of a guy scattering seed. And it said, whatsoever man soweth, that must he also reap. Yes. And I knew when I saw that sign, I was like, I knew that I would be reaping uh, 40 years of a misspent life. And I did. And I, even though I was saved and even though I had a new calling in life and I was born again and all things had become new... It's kind of like I, I, I like to tell people, look, getting saved doesn't mean that anything you did in the past won't come up and, and taunt you again. That's not what it means. The consequence engine continues because let me give you an example. David. David was a man after God's own heart. You know, King David, David and Goliath, David. Yes. He was a man. He was a man after God's own heart. And, um, you know, David had. I, I forget the biblical, biblical account, but I believe I'm correct when I say over 300 wives. Well, I mean, that just sounds like a burden to me. I mean, right. you know, if you have three, <laughs> I mean, well, you know, seriously, <laughs> like we could all have a little fun here, right? Seriously, right. 300 wives. Okay, come on. And so what does a guy with 300 wives need to do with another another woman? That's just right. almost insane. And so I think the point of that whole uh, reality, you know, is that even though he had more than he, more than anyone could ever, you know, 300 wives, that's just, that's insane. I mean, how could you possibly go for some other woman that belongs to, you know, Uriah the Hittite right. and her name's Bathsheba? So how do you end up, you know, selling out and committing adultery and then, you know, committing murder, murder. and then lying to everybody, mm -hmm. you know, for, for this one girl when you got 300 wives. And that didn't include concubines, guys. So, you know, so the, the point of the story is this. So David, he screwed up really bad. He had, you know, more than anyone could possibly deal with. And, and he goes and takes something that doesn't belong to him, then he has her husband killed, and then he lies to everybody. He tries to cover up the whole thing, and then God sends his prophet Nathan over, and, he, and Nathan tells David this story about uh, a very wealthy landowner that had a party and had tons of cattle and sheep and all that. But instead of you know using any of his own cattle for his party, he went and took his neighbor's only sheep, and it's all he had, and he really loved that sheep, and he slaughtered it. And then I uh, had a party, you know, and gave it to his guests. And 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 David became infuriated. Mm -hmm. And David said, bring him to me, you know. He's going to repay it, and then we're going to kill him. And then Nathan points his finger. <laughs> he says, oh, by the way, David, uh, you're the guy, you know. Well, all of a sudden, I mean, that must have been a horrifying moment. Oh, I mean, gosh. could you imagine right then and there what right. you'd feel like? It'd be like, ah! And so Nathan says, well, you know, actually, David, it's you. And the Lord God sent me to tell you, you know, it's you. And by the way, uh, Bathsheba was pregnant. And he said, and so Nathan tells him, by the way, the, the child that Bathsheba is pregnant with is going to die. And by the way, um, the sword will not depart from your house. And, and, and then so, but God forgave David. You know why? Because David admitted his guilt before God. He's like, okay, guilty. I did it. I can't fix it. I'm sorry. Forgive me. And the Lord forgave him. But, but the consequence engine will continue to turn. 
you know, a lot of people, I don't want people to think, oh, if I get saved, ah, oh, you know, any problem I had with the past X, it's just going to go away. No, 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 no. You'll be able to go through it and deal with it on a different level, on a spiritual level, instead of the way you would have had to deal with it previously. However, the consequence engine will continue to turn. And, you know, I just, I think it's important that, you know, a lot of people think, oh, wow, well, when I get saved, everything turns to a bed of roses. Wrong. Um, you know, when I got saved, like I said, I read that big thing on the wall that said, whatsoever man soweth, that must you also reap. And, yeah, it was rough. You know, I, re I reaped a lot of what I had sown, and, and it was it was tough. There was a lot of heartache, but the Lord brought me through it. And honestly, here I am today, 14 years later, and I can honestly say this. I would not trade my life with anybody in the history of the world. I wouldn't. I, I'm just glad to be me. And I'm glad to that I know God. And I know that I was predestined in Christ to be who I am. So I'm totally content in that. You know what I mean? And I, oh, I yeah. really I wish everybody would find that. I know Zen's found it. I know other people that have gotten saved. And once you get saved and once you appropriate that you are in Christ, once you appropriate your identity in Christ, it's going to change you. I mean, it's going to radically change the way you view yourself and the world. So, yeah, it's it's uh, it's an ongoing process, folks. So, Zen, I, I pulled up I pulled up the Versace stuff. Excellent. I'm, sitting, I'm sitting here looking at it. And I'm thinking, uh, um, uh, I was I was going to say, why do you know, why don't we uh, why don't we talk about, you know, the relationship to this commercial and I'll have Dave like Dave or Alyssa or somebody put a link to this commercial in y'all's chat room. Yeah, um, Absolutely. And there's, good. yeah, we, we, I, I want to give you guys a link to this current commercial. It's called Bright Crystal by Versace. And, uh, you know, I, I hope everybody watches this thing and everybody go, what in the hell does this have to do with cologne or perfume? I mean, it's, it's one of the craziest, you know, things you'll ever see as a, as far as a commercial goes. But, but, when you understand or the, the truth and when you understand the origin of of humanity and you watch this crystal, you're, I mean, this bright crystal commercial, your your jaw is going to fall open. Right. You're going to go, oh, my gosh, it's the the origin and the him, the mystery is right there in plain sight. Yes. And so, yeah, we got it. We got it queued up. Um, also, Zen, I want to put in that ad um, down at the bottom of the show note link. For the Versace, everybody, we, we have a we have a link, and one of my people, please put that in in Zen's chat room. Put in the Versace link. Uh, it, it's probably under what's called the commercials. And so, if you put that in Zen's chat room, they can open up all these images. And Zen at the bottom, I I, I grabbed that um, image of. The Hoover Dam, and it's exactly. Oh yeah, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. I'll have Dave put that in. Dave, can you put that in their chat room right now? The image of the uh, of the Hoover Dam. <laughs> it's just so wild. I'm sorry, I can't help laughing. Sometimes I look over at this stuff. I'm like, uh, uh, Jen, can you see your chat room or no? No, I'm not in it. Um, look, okay, Kathy's in there, but I, I'll I can go and log on to it. Well, I just want to, I just I don't know if you can see these images I'm talking about, or if you have the link open because. When you look at it, it speaks volumes. Yes, I, I'm well familiar, you know, with um, with the it, well, yeah, with the images and what you're talking about, just because I've, you know, watched all of your work in connection to all of this. So, right. Well, why don't why don't we um why don't we make the case very quickly for everybody about you know the the combination of the seeds. And, you know, uh, using Genesis 3, uh, also Genesis 6.4, 6 because some people might not know this, and I don't want to take it for granted. You know, I, right. I, I think a lot of times when I hang out with Zen folks, you know what I mean? It's like two guys that hang out and talk about the same thing all the time. Right. Yeah, yeah. We expect that everybody that's listening knows exactly what we're talking about. 
And I don't want to take that for granted. But so let me just give you a couple scriptures. So in case you're new or in case you don't know, at least you have the scriptures behind you. So let's, uh, what do you say we, we start with uh, Genesis 3 very quickly. I'm going to open up Genesis 3, folks. So, and uh, I'm not going to do a bunch of translating. I'm just going to give you the straight up scripture. I'll tell you some words that are important though. Okay, so here we go. In Genesis 3, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God has made. And he said unto the woman, okay, the word for woman is Isha, Nashim. And the first declination of that word is woman is adulteress. And I always make this point. I'm like, guys, why in the world would you ever call a woman any any vocabulary word that had the inference of adulteress, uh, you know, you you get a, you know, if you did that to any other woman you know, you'd get probably a hand right upside your head. You know what I mean? It just, if there's another word for woman, you should use that woman is what I'm, that word is what I'm saying. Like maiden, you know what I mean? Or young maiden, <laughs> or, you know. Right. right. But to use a word that, that, that with the word itself comes, comes the definition adulterous you would want to stay far away from that word you know what i mean you just wouldn't want to even infer it right yeah that's the point so anyway so the serpent said to the woman aka adulteress as per the translation yea god has said you shall eat uh you shall not eat of every tree in the garden question mark and the woman aka adulteress as per the definition said to the serpent, uh, the word is Nakash, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it. Uh, and by the way, I want to I want to take this and I want to make sure everybody understands uh, the word eat. If you go look it up, it means to consume in a variety of ways. And I want to just give you a, a, a thought process because everybody has this idea that Eve got down on an apple. I mean, it's like, well, I, I don't even know where that comes from. But everybody has this picture in their mind that Eve got a hold of an apple and took a bite and that was it. But I want you to understand that the word eat itself means to consume or burn up in a variety of ways. And if you look at the scriptures, Jesus says, you know, unless that, you know, uh, you shall not live on food alone, but every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. So God's word is food. I don't know if y'all know that, but uh, the Bible supports it again and again and again, that the word of God is food. So contrarily speaking, you know, if you eat or you consume the words of your adversary, well, words can go into your heart. You know what I mean? And so... I wanted to kind of bring that up as a point so people can get away from the idea that it's only a bite out of an apple because that ain't it. So anyway, it says, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it. Now, I want I want everybody just not to believe me. Go look this up on your own. Go get e-sword. Go get anything that de defines that word touch right there. And the word touch, it means uh, to lay hands on for any reason, and then it says euphemistically to lie with a woman, like sex. So if it didn't mean that, why would you use that word? You know what I mean? That right. doesn't make any sense. I mean, you would stay away from that word. <laughs> you wouldn't you wouldn't put that word in there and you wouldn't put adulterous with you know the word touch like lie with a woman. Because it just is too obvious that that is exactly what's going on here. Exactly. And so, and so then it says, and the serpent said to the woman, no, you're not going to die. That was a big fat lie. And then he <laughs> said, for, yeah, there, that was the lie right there. No, no, no. It's okay. Go ahead and eat it. You're not going to die. And for God had known the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Well, remember that, you know, one thing Lucifer wanted was, he said, I will ascend above the clouds and I will be like the most high. And by the way, Zen, that word is alien. Yes. And, yes. 
And so Lucifer said, I will be like the most high. He wasn't, he wasn't content, obviously, with his position as being God's most, uh, uh, uh venerated created being. And he wanted more. And so it says, and then iniquity was found and enemy was kicked out. But so here we go. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and desired to make one wise. And she took the fruit of their oven to eat. And she gave also unto her husband. Okay. And then their eyes were open. And then God comes looking for him. This, the last program I did was in. This is where I freaked out. Uh, this happened live on the radio. <laughs> I couldn't believe I ran into this. So then God comes looking for them in the garden and watch what happens. It says, and the Lord God called him to Adam and said unto him, hey, where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And he said, and I love this one. And so Adam said, the man said, the woman, the adulteress that you gave me, <laughs> she is so he's playing, he immediately is playing the blame game. Right. The woman that you gave me, and he plays, so he's kind of blaming it on God, right? He said, the right. woman whom thou gavest me, to, <laughs> she gave it to me and I did eat. And then the Lord God said to the woman, aka adulteress, what is this thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me. The word beguiled means seduced. That holy is Holy seduced. Yeah, it wholly seduced me. And so, I mean, y'all know what seduced is, right? Okay, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. And the Lord said to the serpent, you know, because you've done this, you're cursed. And you're going to eat dust all the days of your life. Well, what was man created out of, right, dust? And he says, and I'll put, here it comes, yes. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. By the way, Zen, you know what? You see that word right there, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel? Yes. Uh, in Genesis 1.26, um, when it says uh, created, one of the words is bruise. Oh, right on. Yeah. And then it said, and the woman said, and he said unto the woman, I will greatly multiply your sorrow. And then when you get down the, to the word wife, in verse 20, it said, and Adam called his wife's name Eve. The word for wife, and I quote, is Isha Nashim, adulterous again. And by the way, Adam, in this verse right here, guys, he hasn't even had sex with his wife yet, but yet here it is in the entire chapter. She's being called adulteress, adulteress, adulteress. Even when she's called his wife, the word is adulteress. And when it comes to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it says you shall not touch it as in lay with a woman. And then you got the word beguiled all together. And then people throw rocks at us. For right, right. <laughs> it's crazy. It's like, uh, it totally and, is. and then people throw rocks at us. Oh, you serpent seed, evil teachers. I'm like, right. oh. that's crazy. It's like, so it's so obvious. So now, so now, obvious. So now that we've laid that out there, now I want to draw everybody's attention to this, uh, just crazy, crazy commercial. Um, what do you think we should do? Just, uh, I should go through maybe and just describe what happens in this commercial and yeah, have, we've and got have, five and, minutes before the next break. So you know what I'll say what before instead of instead of trying to you know launch into the the commercial before uh, the break, right? Um, Alyssa and or Dave or anyone that's in Zen's chat room, please post uh, that commercial link, and I, I encourage everybody to go watch it right now. And during the break, so you can see this commercial. Yes, watch it, perfect. Watch it several times, you know, and then we can talk intelligently about, you know, uh, you know, the, one of the good idea. Hey, the before yeah. we get to break, though, why don't you tie in um, the plaque at the Hoover Dam to this as well? Sure, absolutely. In your show note link tonight, uh, going uh, in tandem with this commercial. Uh, of you know Versace, it shows uh, it shows uh, you know this penis coming out of 
this dry uh, lake bed, you know, like, you know how lake beds are all cracked and the ground is just extremely dry? Well, in the Versace commercial, it shows a penis uh, that's, you know, in the shape of uh, like a quartz crystal, but it's a penis and it comes out of the ground and, um, and you know, she fornicates with it and then her body turns to like crystal and then it shows her her essence trapped inside the crystal, which is exactly what I've been, you know, sharing with everybody since I got saved. And it's exactly what the altar is at the church, you know, the Vatican. But this this uh, plaque that's at the Hoover Dam, it's crazy. It's got it, it looks it's got these two. It's got these two um, towers on both sides of this guy and he's got his hands held up and we're going to put that in your chat room right now. Dave or Alyssa, put that image in the chat room. It's picture E1. So this guy's got his arms held up, kind of like a muscle man at the beach. And uh, in his hands, I want everybody to look very closely. He's holding what looks like wheat in both hands. Well, don't forget the story of the wheat and the weeds in the Bible. Right. Is about two different, you know, grains going together. And weeds and wheat, Darnell's and wheat are identical. They are literally identical. And so this guy's got his arms held up with two different grains. And then uh, his entire body makes Baphomet. And, and then it has this arch and it says, they died to make the desert bloom. And it shows a profile of a guy dead in the water. And they're saying like, oh, we built the dam, you know, and because we built the dam, the desert was able to bloom. They were able to use it for irrigation. And there's, they're making this plaque under the auspice that the people that died during the construction of the Hoover Dam, that this plaque is for them. Wrong. This is for Satan and the fallen angels. Or Satan and his demons. I'm going to reclassify. Satan and his demons uh, orchestrated this plaque through humans because they are saying that, you know, the race of beings that died, which are God's children, is what made the desert bloom because their ground had become parched and was not unproductive. And so that's, that's it. Yeah, absolutely. And also recognize, too, that the weeds and the wheat, the wheat and the tares, they look exactly the same until harvest when the tares stand up haughty and proud and the wheat bow down um you know right. and, and humble themselves for the most time. all right we'll be right back everyone. the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Jonathan? Yeah, one of my favorite parables. You know why? I do. I, because, the, listen, this is, I told everybody when I walked out of that alley the night I got saved, well, I walked into a wall. I mean, I, when you exit the alley, you have to take a right or take a left. Uh, that you don't have any choice. Uh, the alley exits onto, I think, St. Mary Street. And you have to take a right or a left. And if you walk across the street uh, on the wall right there was, you know, this giant carving of a guy sowing seed, um, which is the first part of Matthew 13, which is where this came from. But what blew me away is once the Lord revealed all this stuff to me, you know, about 
you know, the two races of beans and the race that's breeding with us is turning everything upside down. And I, 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 I ended up in Matthew 13 and I went, oh, wow, here's the parable of the, you know, the sower went out to sow. And then when I was reading the story of the wheat and the weeds, I came to verse 30, 35 and I just about freaked out. Guys, I don't know any other parable and I know my Bible pretty well. There is no other there is no other parable that Jesus really explains except the the leaven of the Pharisees. And that's not really an explanation. He just told them he wasn't talking about bread. He was talking about the leaven of the Pharisees, their teachings. But check this out. If you go to verse 35, uh, or let's start in, in verse 34. He said, all these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables. And without a parable, he spake not unto them. And then in verse 35 said that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. I was like, whoa, check it out. So he he's going to utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Now watch this. Verse 36 Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house and his disciples came unto him saying, declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And I want to make a point right here because to understand this is only for God's disciples. Exactly. And I mean, you don't get to understand this unless you're one of his disciples. And that's why it says he sent everybody else away. He sent the multitude away. He went into the house and then he he said he declared the mystery that's been kept secret from the foundation of the world. So here it is. This is the mystery. Yes. He's going to tell them what it is. And so he said, and so Jesus said, and he answered them and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. I mean, goodness gracious. If it doesn't get any more clear than that. And he right. says, so the good seed are the children of the kingdom. What kingdom? God's kingdom. But the terrors are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the terrors are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, just like it says in Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats. It's exactly the same. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. You know what the word offend there is in? You're not going to believe it. What is it's it? a bent sapling snare that oh, turns yeah, everything yeah. upside down. Yeah, yeah right. It's the same thing as Jesus is to them. And he, so and it's gonna, they're going to gather out of the kingdom all things that turn everything upside down and which do iniquity. And shall cast them into the furnace of fire. And then he says, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth, teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Now listen to this. You're going to freak out. Who hath ears to hear? Yes. Let him hear. Guys, wheat has ears. Yes. We, I mean, it even says, who hath ears? <laughs> let them hear. Guys, you know, when Zinn was talking about, it, you know, at the time of the harvest, that the wheat bows down. You know why? Because the heads of grain get real heavy, and then the plant itself leans over because the head of the wheat gets too heavy for the stalk. And so the plant bows down, and it's a representation of Christians. We bow yes. our heads in submission 
to our creator. Exactly. But the weeds, they don't get grain that gets heavy when the harvest, so they stand straight up and they're poisonous. Yes. So and they're them, haughty and proud. Absolutely. It's you know, it's kind of like you you know, you picture some of these guys that think they're real tough and they put their shoulders back and you know, shove their chest out and act like they're real cool. And that's exactly what this is a representation of. Yes. One bows down, one sticks his chest out and acts tough. And then it says, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Because wheat has ears. Yes. Isn't that amazing? It's yeah, it is amazing. Uh, one, one real quick thing as well, since we're talking about this, is that in verse 38 where he says, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. That is a reference to First John chapter three, where it says, "Who Cain, who was of that wicked one," and so that it, that passage is linking that to what happened in the garden. All of this is linked to Eve being beguiled and eating fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because this is where all of that takes place, and that's also why it says. The enemy, which is referencing the parable of the sower, the enemy that snuck into the garden that sowed the tares, that enemy is the devil. That's right. It's exactly right. I mean, this is it's perfect. I mean, it's absolutely perfect. If you just look at it and go, oh, my gosh, it's perfect. Right. It's exactly right. Which, yeah, it's, it's just also fascinating the way it all fits together. Yes. That, you know, a lot of people can't deal with the fact that Cain was a child of the devil. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Time out, time out, time out. It says, you know, in John, First John, it says, well, you do the works of your father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. Well, what was the first murder on planet Earth? Well, Cain, you're of your, yeah, yeah, you're Cain, of your father, the, the devil. devil. Right. He was a murderer from the beginning. Right. Let me give you a def another word for the beginning, Genesis. Exactly. <laughs> he exactly. was a murderer from the beginning, Genesis. Right. And he <laughs> is a liar. Oh, uh, surely you won't die, Eve. He is right. a liar and the right. liar, right. and the father of it is like, yes. oh, guys, it's a no-brainer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anyway, me, so, totally, yeah. But it may, I mean, it really makes absolute total sense. Oh, total sense. Absolutely. <laughs> I know. It's just fascinating. Yeah. And what, what cracks me up is you run into these people that are just, you know, they're just militant about serpent seed, which oh, is burn, them, burn oh, the serpent totally. seed. Guys. I'm like, guys, what is wrong with you? Right. This, it's so ridiculously obvious. It's like, stop it. Right. But yeah, yeah. Right. But, you know, that's just. Because and we got to be, we also got to be gracious and benevolent. Because you know what, I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. It says to you it has been given. Oh, by the way, yes. what I what I'm quoting is right here in Matthew 13. Right. It says to you it has been given to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not, not been, been given. given yeah. And so, see, it's given. So, you know, sometimes I get really excited just because it's so amazing. But we can't we can't be hateful to them because, right. you know what? It was given to me and it wasn't given to them. Exactly. So I can't be mean to someone that didn't get the same gift, you know. Right. Yeah, so, absolutely. Absolutely. So anyway, so here we go back to the screen. Uh, if you're watching you now and if you're, if you're in Zen's chat room, uh, Alyssa, Dave, or anybody – Please post an image of of the um, Hoover Dam. It's picture it's picture E one, and this is a plaque at the Hoover Dam, and in it's supposed to be you know for the people that died during the making of the Hoover Dam. But I want you to look at something. I want you to look how easy it is to see the enemy in it. If you look above the guy's head, you'll see a pyramid that's. That's made by lightning bolts. That's with that's called intent. And then in the middle of the pyramid, you'll see this oval. Uh, it's actually a vesica Pisces, and that is the beginning of all flesh. And so they're identifying themselves as, you know, the ones that are behind this. 
And then what's really fascinating is on both sides, it's got the pillars kind of like, you know, the pillars of Solomon and it's, you know, two different arches. And it also, again, represents two different races. Then the guy's hands are up. He's got his palms, you know, holding these two different grains. One represents wheat. One represents weeds. And then if you look at the cumulative sum of the guy's body and you don't look at his face, which I'm going to cover up on you now, and you just look at the cumulative sum of his body, it's Baphomet. And the eyes of the, you know, the goat are made by the nipples on his chest. And then you can very easily see that his stomach and his chest um, make the face of the goat. And then the arms going up make the horns. And so it's a representation of Baphomet. And then it says, they died to make the desert bloom. And then down here in the water on the left-hand side of the image, you'll see an image of a guy's face in the water. And... um. I would submit to you right now that I'm looking at it and I can tell there's something terribly wrong with it. So maybe after the program, I'll start looking at that. It's not right. The artwork, there's something going on. They're hiding something in it. So anyway, so yeah, there's a, there's an image of a guy that's dead in the water and uh, they're saying they died to make the desert bloom. Um, like it's supposed to be referring to guys that died during the construction of the Hoover Dam. That is not at all what it's about. There's just like they're saying, uh, you know, just like uh, the the reality that God's children died to create this other race of beings that's being produced in the pit, which is about to, you know, I know it's coming. The, the pit's going to open. And when it does, you're, whoever's on this planet is going to see that race of beings. And it is a supernatural race of beings called the Locust Army and God have mercy for anybody that's here, even if you're saved, even if you have the seal of God on you, if you have to see that, what's coming, because it's going to be absolutely horrifying, just like the Bible says. So anyway, this is the image of the Hoover Dam. Now I want to show you how it's the same as this um, this uh, image on the Versace commercial. So there it is. They died to make the desert bloom. Now let's look at the Versace commercial. There's a girl... And she comes down and she lands from the sky, and I'll, I'll put that in your, I'll put that uh, the first picture on on you now, um, Dave or Alyssa or any one of you guys, please put these in in Zen's chat room as I say them, please. Okay. So anyway, picture A five. You can see a silhouette of a woman landing, and it's representation of an angel. And it, and so she comes down from heaven and she sits down on this dry riverbed. And I want to show that to you because you can see her hands on this dry, cracked riverbed. Now I want you to think of that plaque like at the Hoover Dam. They died so the desert could bloom. Just look at look at her hands. She's got her hands on the desert ground and there's dry cracks because there's no life there. There, you know, there's nothing, nothing growing, <clears throat> just like the plaque of the Hoover Dam. Now, out of the dry ground, uh, here comes a penis growing out. Come, all these penises come growing out of the ground. Could somebody please explain to me what does that have to do with the perfume commercial? <laughs> right. I mean, <laughs> but I saw it like, I was like, what the hell? What is this? I mean, it was it was a shock. I'm not kidding. I was shocked. I was like, what in the world? I mean, what are they selling? Condoms? I mean, seriously, because <laughs> it's a penis. And so anyway, so the very next scene, scene is the, the penis comes out of the ground and then it shows the girl she's sitting naked. Once again, another uh, reference to the Garden of Eden. I mean, there she is. She's sitting there naked in front of a penis. And I really was, I was going, what in the world is this a commercial for? You know, you, you know, because you got to have a little bit of trepidation while you're watching this. You're like, God, this is about to get really, really bad. You know, I, maybe I should turn this off, but it's a Versace commercial right. or cologne or for perfume. So anyway, 
So the penis comes out of this dry ground and then <clears throat> it, it just shows the girl with her head back and she, you know, she's naked and she's obviously having sex. And then <clears throat> it shows her exhale and then her whole body turns to like crystal. Her body turns from one type of skin to another. Wow. From one type of body and then because she laid with it like a woman, then her body became a prison. I mean, you got to be kidding, right? And so all of a sudden her body turns to a prison and then she breathes out her last breath and picture B1 I'm going to I'm going to put on the screen now. It shows her last breath going out of her mouth. And if you look at her eye in the commercial itself and you freeze frame it, her eyes in turns to a serpent slit. Right. Yeah, her eye turns to a serpent slit. One eye is in the dark and then the other eye turns to a serpent slit and she breathes out her last breath and then her essence her essence is trapped in the bottle. And I'll show you that the next picture is A4. And you can see right there very clearly. There she is trapped inside the bottle. And what's really so fascinating about the bottle is the lid on top of the bottle is the vesica Pisces. Oh, wow. That's just mind-boggling. Yeah. yeah totally. I mean, so we really literally have, and I'm not kidding, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not, I'm not allowed to, you know, exaggerate. You're literally looking at the mystery of the human race on a Versace commercial. I mean, that's mind boggling. Yes. It's a perfume commercial. And they, <laughs> they, they got the whole thing just absolutely perfect. It's just mind boggling. And for those of y'all that haven't seen, uh, the other commercials, I don't know if the Coco Mademoiselle commercial is in this link, but. There, we have another commercial that I broke down, and it's with uh, Coco Mademoiselle, uh, another another uh, cologne or another perfume, and it's the exact same thing. Wow. Yeah. You you haven't seen the Coco commercials in? No, I haven't seen that one. Oh. Uh, okay. Well, I will copy that one and send it to your email. All right. Yeah. Cool. So this is all the manifestation of the spirit that's running humanity. And it just, you know, that's why the Bible says you can tell every tree by its fruit what it produces. So if we're looking at, you know, a commercial that's producing the exact truth of the Garden of Eden, then what, I mean, what's producing it? Who's producing it? Well, it has to be Satan. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and because he's telling, he's just repeating the same truth that we're telling people. And, uh, I mean, it's just further confirmation. I mean, because you know how they um, like to boast about there being the elect and knowing the truth, of all the things that are hidden from Absolutely. the rest of us. It's in Isaiah. Those who yes. rule my people mock them, says the Lord. Yes. Because those who rule us, they mock us and they make fun of us because we're blind. It's like those images that those guys drew of me when they draw an image of me and they put a dead sheep on my head, uh, they, they close my eyes. They make me look like I'm blind. And then they come up, hey, I drew a picture of you, and they hand me an image of myself. And, you know, some guy draws an image of me, and I'm thinking, why in the hell are you drawing an image of me? What, are you cruising me? Are you creeping on me? You know what I mean? That's just really weird. Right. Uh, a dude... To hand another <laughs> dude a picture he drew of him. You know what I mean? And yeah. I mean, he doesn't have a lisp or anything. It's like, oh, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, why are you drawing a picture of me? I'm confused. <laughs> you know, I'm just, and then on the picture that they give me, they have my eyes closed. And then on top of my head is an image of a dead sheep with its tongue sticking out. It's like, you got to be kidding, right? And see, they're mocking us because they don't think we can see. And I'll tell you honestly, I could not see the sheep with its tongue sticking out uh, when Marcel handed me that image he drew of me until after I got saved. That fulfills the scripture, John 9, 39. Jesus said, I've come to judge the world and to give sight to the blind like I was. And he says, and to show those who think they see that they are blind. 
And then the Jews said, hey, are you saying that we're blind? And then Jesus said, you know, if you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty. But your guilt remains because you claim you can see. And so there it is. After I got saved, all of a sudden I could tell that the guy that drew the picture of me with the dead sheep on my head, that he put a dead sheep on me, but I couldn't see it before I got saved. Yeah, it's it, amazing. It is. It's so mind-boggling. So anyway, that's what's going to be on that DVD we're working on. Excellent. We're going we're going from the alley and we're going from we're actually going from before the alley starting with the skydiving thing all the way through to now. And we're just layering it with all this dead sheep, you know, uh, exhibits like exhibit one through 14. And uh, it's conclusive. It's a no brainer. It's not even arguable in a court of law. It's not arguable. Yeah. It's amazing because uh, my friend, Dr. Joy Jeffries Pugh, she wrote a book, uh, a series from Eden to Armageddon. And she is also a confirming witness to the things that we're talking about here. And so, um, you know, out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, shall the truth be established. We got just a couple minutes, brother. I want to give you a chance to give out your website, contact information, also your radio program, and then final comment. Right. Well, first of all, I love you, Zen. Thank you. I love coming love you on. Love you too, man. I love Solid coming on. I, I love coming on your show. It's just you know, I have to admit when I come on your show, it's like uh, going to the playground for a kid. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah, it's like, awesome. I, 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 it's it's easy just to chill and enjoy myself. You know, a lot of times when you go on radio programs, uh, you know, when you're invited as a guest, you know, sometimes it feels a little awkward. Sometimes. Like uh, I've had. <laughs> yeah. I won't mention any names, Hagman. <laughs> Hagman. <laughs> <laughs> ah, sorry. I couldn't help myself. I was like, come on, guys. Anyway, but uh, yeah, it's always fun to come hang out, man. I love it. Um, yeah, guys, if y'all want to just, you know, get into this and if you want to experience that the, the joy that I have in my heart, and I mean, I, I highly suggest you start knocking on the door, um, apply the key that I gave you tonight. Just turn everything upside down and backwards. Uh, go read the Acts of Peter. Um, uh, go read the Acts of Peter, verse 37, 38, and 39. Um, I want to read to you before this program closes out, if I can, um, the Acts of Peter. Let me see. I don't think I'll have enough time, though. Um, Y'all just, you know what? Y'all go do it yourselves. Go type into Google the Acts of Peter, and go to verse 37, 38, and 39. I'll give you the bullet point right now. And Peter, after they hung him up in the manner he desired, which was upside down, he said, learn ye the mystery of all things and what it was from the beginning. He said, and then he says, and learn what the Lord saith in the mystery, unless you make the things of the left as the things of the right, and the things of the right as the things of the left, and as those above as those below, you will have no knowledge of the kingdom of heaven. And all that means is turn it upside down. And because if you have a cross and you're looking at a cross and you look at the right hand, the left hand, if you turn that cross upside down, right becomes left, left becomes right, top becomes bottom, bottom becomes top. And that's the mystery of all things. And it's right there. It's, it's so profound. So praise God then. Thank you, brother. God bless you. God bless all of you. And also, please go check out the series we did, The Secret of Secrets, a four-part where we explain all of this as well. Talk to you Thank soon, you. man. Thank you. I love you, brother. God love bless. Love you too, man. God bless.